This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G find our podcast and subscribe. Well, we have a, a show I am very excited about here. We're having a return guest of ours who uh, I think is uh, one of our best uh, podcasts, just a great one about uh, his story and uh, how he got involved in real estate investing with his first purchase being an office building. And if you don't already know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Brian Murray. And Brian acquired his first investment property in 2007 without raising any outside capital. Brian bootstrapped his way from newbie investor to founder and CEO of Washington Street Properties, a commercial real estate investment and property management company that is ranked on the Inc. 500 5000 list, the fastest growing private companies for five years in a row. In 2015, Brian Murray was recognized with a Gold Stevie Award for Executive of the Year in the real estate industry. Brian is also the author of a book I'm sure you're familiar with, a best-selling and award-winning book, Crushing It in Apartments and Commercial Real Estate. It's like one of my favorite real estate books, and it's listed in our top 20 real estate books to get a hold of, uh, which sold more than 20,000 copies in its first year of publication and garnered positive reviews from Publishers Weekly, Forward Reviews, and Blue Ink Review. The book was chosen as a Gold Award winner at the 2018 Robert Bruss Real Estate Book Awards. It was also named a Gold Award winner by the Nonfiction Authors Association, a finalist for the Best Book Awards in Business, Personal Finance and Investing, and finalist for the Next Generation Indie Book Awards Finance and Investment category. In addition to his endeavors in writing and real estate, Brian Murray has worked as a teacher, technology executive, management consultant, and engineer. His media appearances include interviews on CNN, PBS, and CBS Market Watch. Brian was quoted by the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and dozens of other major newspapers around the country. He holds a degree from Syracuse University, John Hopkins University, and Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Wow, what a what a background. Brian, welcome back to the Old Dogs REI Network. Thanks, Bill. I'm really excited to be here. Big fan of your podcast, so I'm, I'm really excited to be back. Oh, man, we are a big fan of you, Brian. Uh, you, you are just like, you are totally crushing it, just like the title of your book says. Now, I, I am just like in awe when you talk about your stories of how, you know, you were a, a teacher kind of working on the side and growing this unbelievable real estate enterprise now that just has taken on a whole new shape and form. So I am just like dying just to hear from you. So I just got to stop talking here. But <laughs> but uh, I want to hear you know, kind of what's happened over the last couple of years since we last talked. 
Yeah, so you know we continue to continue to grow the company. We've got assets in, in uh, a lot of different asset classes, but I think over the last two years since we spoke, we've focused primarily on multifamily. Um, so we've, we've we've added, you know, a, a couple hundred more uh, apartment units to our portfolio, and um, you know it's 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 more challenging these days to to find those good deals. But we, you know, our our bread and butter is to go in and find distressed assets and turn them around. And, um, you know, that's how we're able to find, still find the occasional good deal. So, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's pretty much been our focus. Oh, that's neat. Well, one thing uh, that, uh, that I just was very impressed with too, is you, one, you're, you're actually a very humble guy for all, all of the accomplishments that you've achieved here. But, uh, you know, I remember you talking about that first apartment building that you got and, uh, you were working full time as a teacher, you went in there, not only just. To, to manage the building and to be the, uh, you know, the property manager, but you were also the janitor. You were the repair guy. You were, you were just like everything. And, and you're doing that and working full time as a teacher. I am just like in awe of just your, your dedication. And, uh, you know, you're not afraid to roll up your sleeves and do what has to be done. So, so I imagine if you get these distressed properties, you're probably you know the first guy out there with a tool belt on, uh, even though you don't have to. I'm sure you can afford to hire the people in. But uh, I, I I really like how you 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 do watch your 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 expenses and you've um, really managed to not just acquire properties but to to make them very profitable. So um, yeah, I I I just uh, I think it's uh, it's neat. I do want to hear about some you know as, you, as you've kind of moved into. Um, I know you've acquired uh, more commercial or office buildings, but uh, now w- with more of an emphasis in in, uh, in multifamily. Now, is that a conscious decision because m- maybe you know the office uh, area is not as uh, you know as profitable as it was, or uh, or is it just kind of where you ended up? You know, I think it's probably a combination. Um, you know, the uh, the the office and retail sectors of uh, you know it's. I think I think getting experience in the different asset classes, uh, there's there's a lot of similarities, and, and you know I've had a lot of people say, oh, you, should, you really need to focus. You're you're kind of spread on all these different things, and and uh, you know there's a lot of reasons why we we diversified that way. Um, one of which is I just I love to learn and you know uh, you know solve those puzzles and and figure out how to how to get involved in, in different types of properties, but. They're more, they're, there's more commonalities than I think um, most people realize. And the basic principles are the same and, and, and especially our value add approach where, you know, we're looking for those properties that aren't well managed and uh, to step in and turn things around. And each asset class has its pros and cons, right? So um, I, think, I think what I found over time was that um, some of the appeal of the, of the multifamily um, I, I love the tenants. Like I, I, li- I love the idea of, of uh, being able to make a make a difference and improve their their homes and and the community in that way. And um, you know, I, I think another advantage. I, I really like that you can kind of control your occupancy a little bit more. And what I mean by that is with the office and retail, if you have a vacant space, you can sometimes have to sit on that space for a really long time. The market doesn't necessarily react quickly to changes in, in rent. So oftentimes, um, in addition to that, you also will have a very large percentage of your space occupied by an individual tenant. So when we do invest in office spaces, I've, I've tried to find buildings that have um, not too much space allocated to a single tenant and, um, you know, try to spread the risk that way. But, you know, even with our efforts in that regard, we've had multiple times where we've lost a tenant that takes up maybe 40 to 50 percent of the space in a, in a property. And immediately overnight, you know, that that property will be cash flow negative. And that that's quite a blow. Right. Um, and oftentimes you've got to find a tenant that fits that specific location, that tenant mix. Um you know, the, the configuration of the space, you know, there's certain limits to what you can do with it. And so if you adjust the price, you might st- still not find that perfect tenant, right? So, um, you know, if you contrast that with multifamily and you generally, if you've got 
you know, enough units, you've got your rent spread out and diversified across all those tenants. So if you lose a tenant or two or three, uh, you still might be okay. And, um, you know, the, uh, if, if you find that your occupancy is say dropping a little bit, you can offer a concession or you can adjust those rents. And generally you'll see in a pretty quick response from the market. And, you know, that's, that, that allows you to, to, to make some good decisions and, and keep a, keep your place occupied. Um, and so there's more within your control, I guess, in terms of the, the, the rental income, you know, those are just a few of the factors. I think one other thing that some people are surprised about, but you know, a lot of folks who haven't done both asset classes, they, they, they feel like the office tenants would be, uh, much better to manage, right? You know, they're thinking, oh, you know, these are professional professionals in the workplace and they're going to be a lot more easy to deal with than, you know, who knows what type of residential tenant you have. Um, but it, but in my experience, I actually have enjoyed working with the apartment tenants more. I think oftentimes you'll have a, um, an office tenant that could be pretty difficult, you know, pretty demanding and unreasonable at times. And, you know, sometimes when you're working with some, you know, it could be any type of professional, a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, somebody like that. Um, sometimes they, they, you know, that, that can be a challenge. But those are just a few of the, a few of the reasons we, we still have a lot of office space and retail space, but, um, our, our emphasis has grown, I think, on, on the multifamily, and if if you look back when you and I spoke last, we were probably about fifty fifty, and right now we're probably more like two thirds multifamily. Oh, neat! Yeah. Now on the on the commercial side, did you ever um, look at sort of triple net or big box type, you know, commercial properties, anything like that? I have looked at that. I mean, actually, quite a few years ago, I made the decision to buy a, a Dollar General. That was a, yeah, that was, that was a single, single tenant. It was double net. Um, and I'll tell you what, like that, it, it was probably a good investment and we got those checks in the mail, but, um, I, I just, I just didn't find it very rewarding. You know, there was no opportunity to add value and, you know, that was, that's the kind of been our secret recipe. That's how we've, we've grown from the beginning and, and not had to raise capital and, um, you know, that's a very stable investment. It's a good fit for some people. But, but after I had that for about two years, I, I found a great value add project and I, and I sold it and I, I put that money into the other project. So. Gotcha. You mentioned, you know, didn't have to raise capital. And that uh, to me is like, what, you know, um, I, you know, I, I want to kind of look at that area. I'd love to, because you have been very creative. I mean, even the first property that you you received, right? You, you really didn't have much money going into it. It'd be nice to kind of hear some of your creative financing approaches uh, to, you know, the, you know, the commercial as well as the multifamily. Yeah, sure. So when we find a value add property, you know, we we're generally identifying before we go in what exactly we can do to um, increase our equity in that property. So knowing that going in, it, it gives us a little more comfort to leverage that property as much as we can. So our goal, you know, if I know that within a few months to a year, you know, we can increase the value of a property by say 30 or 40%, then I'm going to look at every possible way that we can reduce the amount of cash that we need to close on that property, because that's going to dramatically boost our cash on cash returns. And so, you know, over the years, we've we've worked with a lot of different types. Of, like you mentioned, the very first property we bought was a, a mortgage assumption, um, and the second property we bought was an owner finance situation. Um, you know, so several years into this whole endeavor, I still hadn't been able to get a bank to lend to me, um, but I found ways around that. And I think, kind of being in that situation where banks just kept saying no and wouldn't work with me forced us early on to get creative and figure out ways to buy properties without needing a bank. And now that banks will finally lend to us, we've held on to some of those strategies and, and we've, we've mixed them with, with bank financing. So, um, I would say probably the two most common strategies that we use are those, those first two that, that I, that I mentioned that we, we relied on. 
um, you know, one being uh, mortgage assumptions and another being seller financing. Um, the seller financing, I think, is is way underutilized. And in today's hot market, you know, it depends on what you're buying and where you're buying it, to what extent you can get a seller interested in extending financing. But many people just rule it out immediately. And they say, oh, there's no way, you know, they're, they're not going to do seller financing. And um, what we like to do is a very small piece of the deal in owner financing. So that way, you know, if, if a seller, a seller doesn't need to own a property outright, as long as they have a, a good amount of equity, they might be willing to uh, lend a portion of, of the sale. So what, what, what would be typical for us is let's say we have a property, we're really interested. You know, we learn, we, we always try to learn as much as we can about the seller. We try to learn as much as we can about their debt situation. And if it seems like it might be a good fit, you know, we'll often open with an aggressive offer where we know we're going to get a counter, you know, and when that counter comes back, um, and we counter again and we're bringing our price up, that's a good time to, to introduce the idea of uh, seller financing. You know, that way you're not starting right out of the gate with a seller thinking, oh, this is somebody who can't come up with the cash. This, you know, they're, they're, no one will, will, is willing to lend to this person. And instead, I prefer to introduce it in a very small way. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give them a concession on price. Then in exchange, I'll say, you know, I can come up on price, but you know, if you could give me, say, 5% seller financing, that'll allow me to offer you more money because it'll be less cash out of my pocket and I can improve my cash on cash return. And so I can get my better return at the same time you can get your better price. Mm, I like that. So at that point, you know, the seller might go back and, you know, they'll, they're, if it's a uh, if it's not somebody who owns a lot of properties and has a ton of experience, they might they might need to dig into that a little more and figure out what that means. A lot of times they'll talk to an accountant or, or their attorney or somebody about it. And, you know, at that point, they might find out, hey, this this is an opportunity to defer some gains as well, maybe earn some interest. And it's particularly effective on, say, someone who's older and, and uh, you know, decided they don't want to keep that property anymore. They want to move on and do something else, not necessarily planning to exchange it for a larger property, trying to figure out, hey, maybe they've relied on that property for income for many, many years. And they're thinking, what, you know, how am I going to reinvest it? And you're giving away right out of the gate to say, hey, you can take a portion of those proceeds, earn interest on it, get a check in the mail every month and defer some of those capital gains, maybe even reduce your capital gains rate on, on the initial sale. And then when we go back and forth, that 5% might become 10, 10% might become 15. Um, and you kind of have to, you kind of have to gauge it on, on the seller and their situation, how motivated they are. And what I've found is quite a few sellers are, they're, they're driven primarily by price. And they're willing to make concessions in many other areas if they can get their price that they want. So, you know, the goal would be, you know, get help them to get their price and in exchange allow you to sort of set the term to get to that price. So so what does the structure of that look like? Is that a second trustee on the property? Uh, yeah, how, how is it structured? So that they, so they're taking a second position. So and then it would have to say that in the offer that they're willing to take a second position to a bank, and then you want to work with a portfolio lender, which is generally one of a local bank or a regional bank. The 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 national lenders or you know Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or somebody like that. They're they're not going to want to see a second position. In fact, most of them will prohibit that. But local banks aren't aren't under those those same. Uh, constraints. So what I'll do is I'll say, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll borrow 75% or 70% from a bank. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll lower the loan to value for the first position to make the bank even more comfortable with that arrangement. But most, most uh, smaller banks, what they're going to really look for is, are you still going to hit the debt service coverage ratio that you need? to cover both of those loans. And if you can, most of them are okay knowing that they've got the first position. So 
you know, maybe maybe the bank will lend 75%, maybe your seller will lend another 10, now you're at 85% loan to value. And then you can start to look for other smaller ways to reduce your cash even more. So, um, you know, I could go over a few of those as well. I'd like you to. And on that second, what, what are the terms sort of generally speaking? I know they may vary from uh, deal to deal, but uh, what would be sort of a typical term uh, on that second? So what I try to do is I'll start with um, – a very long amortization period. So I want to put out there probably like 30 years and, um, and a low interest rate and maybe go from there. And if I'm going to negotiate, I prefer to negotiate the interest rate up rather than the amortization period because you're going to get a much lower monthly payment with a longer amortization period. And then usually the seller will want a balloon payment at some point. They're going to say, well, you know, they get a, collecting that interest is great, but at some point I'm going to want my money so I would say the most common would be a, a five-year balloon where you're, make, you're, you're structuring your payments on a 30-year amortization period um, with, with a, a competitive interest rate, and then you're going you're gonna to pay them the full balance due um, at a certain point. And maybe it's three years, five years, seven years. Um, you know, and, and again, it really depends on on what your what your seller is looking for. I, you know, I'm I'm glad to push that out further if that's what they want. But a lot of them are, I would say, five years would be most common. Gotcha. Okay, let's talk more about that. So that additional raise you were talking about. Yeah. So once we once we've kind of got the lending squared away, you know, we're, we're also we can also look at other ways to say, well, I'm going to show up at closing. How can I do that with the the least amount of cash possible. Um, so some of the things I'll do, like, like I mentioned, a, a lot of the properties that we're acquiring are distressed in some way. They've got some sort of upside and, and, and by that very nature, you know, that, that means that they've got some downside, uh, some things that need to be improved. So I'll often use that to say, you know, let's, let's say for example, that, um, I don't know the the uh, the the roof. Say it's it's in it's pretty worn. You can see it's near the end of its life, and you can you can tell the seller, oh, "Listen, it's pretty obvious the roof is the roof is coming near the end of its life." Um, you know, I, I'm going to put a credit in there for, and you could you know choose your number. Could be ten thousand, could be a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to ask for a credit at closing in this amount. Um, you know, it's going to be a, um, you can either have it specifically for that item or what I actually prefer to do even more is to say right into the offer, a deferred maintenance credit. And, you know, that'll give me, that'll give me the freedom to decide how I want to use the funds afterward. And so as long as you don't go crazy with that, most lenders will let that go. They're not going to, um, lower the purchase price and net that out. They're going to keep the purchase price as long as it appraises and let you get that credit back when they're calculating out the closing credits. So th that's often, I mean, I, I've even done situations where we've reached a final price and let's say it's $300,000. I'll go back and say, listen, I want to, I want, is it okay if we raise this to 310, I'm going to put a $10,000 credit in there. Okay, so you add on to the as opposed to reducing the price with it. You could exactly interesting. You, you could do it that way. If I feel like that seller is not going to entertain that along during negotiations, I could wait till we settle on a price and then say, "I'll pay. I want to pay you more, and I'm going to get this credit back." I, I don't have any issues explaining to them why I want to do it. You know, it's it's so that I can take a purchase price to the bank that's higher, and then you know, exercise that credit off of that price without, you know, uh, it's much more likely to appraise at, at the, at the contract value than, you know, to hope that they, they appraise it higher. Now, is that going to also be an issue with agency lending? These, these strategies really work the best with, with local lenders. Um, there, I believe you can have credits with agency debt, but I think there's, there's limits to it. So, you know, flags are going to start to pop up for some of those lenders. If you, you're getting a credit at closing more than say two or 3%, uh, of the purchase price. But, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, 2% of the purchase price is still a lot of money, right? You're still significantly reducing your cash in at closing. And when you figure out what that does to your cash on cash return, um, you know, if let's say you were going to be putting 20% in, but now you're going to be putting 18% in, you know, that's a drop of two out of 20. You're basically cutting your cash by 10%. Um, and then you, in, in turn, your cash on cash return is going to go way up. Um, so anything you can do, you know, and, 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 and those credits are, 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 are one item. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, other things that people don't generally think about, um, I always try to schedule my closings for early in the month. Um, and the reason I do that, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I make sure that the language in the contract is there to prorate the rents, and that, that should be expected. You shouldn't get any resistance for that. Um, and the reason you want to have it early in the month is if you prorate the rents, you know, the seller will have to collect the rent, and then they'll credit you the bulk of the month at closing. So the ideal situation for me is I want to close, say, around the 5th, the 6th, something like that, so that the rents have come in, and then I can get you know, the largest, large percentage of the rent at closing. And, and again, that's another, that's another chunk of cash that usually can add up to another, say, 1% or more of the purchase price. Or, um, and so, um, you know, that, that, that can make a, make a really big difference. Um, if you're doing a commercial property, like not a multifamily, um, deposits are treated differently. So, um, you know, when I when I buy an office building, for example, the deposits are uh, credited to me at closing, and with commercial properties, those funds can be commingled with your operating account. So it's it's different than when you're renting to you know if you have an apartment, it's a residential type of situation where by law you're expected to to keep those funds separate. You know, in, in, in a commercial property like an office or retail, that's you don't have to do that. So you find that there's another one or two percent of your purchase price that you're getting a credit at closing, which is the security deposits. Mm, that's great. That's great. If you look through any contract and you just have to remember that every item in there that you're going to have to pay for at closing is open to negotiation. That doesn't mean that there's not, you know, conventions in the in the area that you're doing business. So, you know, if 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 uh, the purchaser, for example, would always pay the mortgage tax, and, and that's the case in in most places, um, you know, is, are they going to object if you say that they have to pay it? They they probably would, you know. But again, it's something where you can work with different things. Sometimes you, you they'll you'll make a concession and then you get one back, but. Anything in there, um, the survey, you know, who's going to pay for the survey. Um, th those are the types of things that, hey, some of these things get handled differently in different states and, and different things, but it doesn't mean you can't go against the way it's traditionally done. I, I, everything's negotiable. And, and the negotiations that you're making, it doesn't matter if it's an off-market, on-market, whether you're dealing with brokers or uh, direct-to-seller, um, it, it, it just works yeah, uh, I would imagine just uh, in that uh, that contract and negotiation period. Yeah, it doesn't matter e either way. I think um, to figure out what's going to really work, you know, the more insights you can get into the seller situation, the better. And um, you know, I, I think that one of the things to try to do up front is to sort of overcome any objections to sharing information on the seller's debt. I find that. The more experienced the seller is or the more experienced the broker is, they understand that there's really no harm in that, um, you know, that, that there's some, they can only stand to benefit because if a buyer can figure out a way to use their knowledge of that debt situation of learning what that debt situation is, um, you know, because you might find, you know, the other, the other piece here is that you might find that they've got good debt and you might be better off assuming that debt. Um, in some cases, the, the debt on a, on a property might be higher than what you're paying um, or close to it. And you might be able to figure out a way. You know, actually, the most recent property that I acquired, 
uh, which is a 126 unit apartment complex. The, um, the seller's debt was $4.7 million. And I, uh, put the property under contract for $5 million. So I, um, agreed to assume their mortgage. So I ended up putting in basically $300,000 for a $5 million property. So that's less than, you know, what is that? Six, uh, 6% down. Gee whiz, <laughs> that's great, man. Oh man. Um, well, do, are you still? I, I mean, I know when I f first talked to you, you were mainly buying properties local or in your area. Have you since moved uh, to other regions out of state or uh, further away? So, just this year, we've really started to reach a point where you know I, I still, if I if I could. Um, grow without too much risk locally you know we, i'm i'm not actually in a in a super strong market you're in upstate new york right exactly yeah and uh you know that's a different market than than new york city so it's it's um it doesn't have the growth rates and the job growth that you'll find in some of the other parts of the country so um you know i, I it would be great if we had assets in other places but we're so hands on and we've been successful with that that i've been reluctant to um you know, compromise that by, by going far away. And even though there's, there's many pros to consider as well. Um, but this year we've made a commitment. We're going to expand. And, um, I have a property under contract right now. That's in a location that still in New York, but it's, it's, uh, it's over, uh, for the first time I'm, I'm working with folks to, um, evaluate, uh, raising money and syndication projects. Yeah. The company, our company's reached a, a size where, um, it's becoming really hard to maintain that, that growth rate that we've been fortunate enough to, to have to this point, but to continue to grow organically, uh, we either have to slow our growth way, way down or, um, consider taking in, in, you know, funds from outside. And I've also reached a point where, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate with how our, our company has done and, and, and it's appealing to think about, you know, allowing, say, limited partners to come in and invest some money and, and, and help some other people on their path to, you know, financial freedom through real estate. And if I can, if I can do that, you know, it's, it's just something that would be more rewarding than just, you know, helping the tenants and helping the community. I can help other investors get started. So, you know, I'm, I'm, um, uh, that project that's a little further away, you know, that, that will be the first, first project that we've, um, take, you know, raised, raised money from investors. And, and, and that, you know, that, that one's scheduled to close in about a month. So how many, how many doors do you have right now in multifamily? Uh, we're, we're up to about 600. So 600 doors and you've never syndicated. That That's right. <laughs> it's amazing, Brian. Wow. That is really amazing. And, and you know, what's, I mean, I just, you just always blow my mind here and I'm going to look, you know, upstate New York, you're right. You know, it's not, uh, it doesn't show up on sort of the top growth areas. It doesn't have a lot of the, you know, the things that, uh, you know, we're often looking for emerging markets and things like that, but yet you're, you're still crushing it in this area that, um, you know, an area that it's probably fairly stable. Um, I, you know, I don't think there's declining, you know, uh, uh, economies, but I mean, probably just, you know, just slow and steady, but, uh, that you've grown to that size, uh, without syndicating is amazing. This is a uh, really, really something. Gosh, <laughs> that's great. I appreciate that. You know, I, I think it's just a different path and, and you can, you can increase your, the value of your real estate in a lot of different ways. Right. So if you're in a, if you're in a hot growth market and rents are climbing, um, you know, that, that's going to boost the value of your real estate. But, you know, the other option is you go into a market that's maybe not so hot. And what are the advantages of that? Well, the, you know, the first is that you're, you're probably going to get a better return because your cap rate's going to be higher, right? So you get into those tertiary markets and places where, are, where the big, the big guys don't generally want to play and you get a lot less competition for those projects. So you're probably going to go in right up front with a, with a better deal. And that means you're going to have cash flow better, right? So if you're going to get, if you can maintain those higher returns and, you know, you have less competition, you know, that, that sets you up to earn, uh, you know, increase the value of your real estate in a, in a different way than say riding the wave of a, 
of a, of a major metropolitan area that, that's booming. Both of them work. Um, you know, but I, I think sometimes people get too wrapped up and I've got to, I've got to be in the best market in the country. I've got to be in the perfect place. I've got to ride that wave and ride that growth. You know, there's other ways to do it, right? You can, you can do it in your hometown. You can do it in your area, even if you're in a rural location, but if in your, in one of those really hot markets and it, it could be challenging and maybe you need to think about going say, you know, an, an hour or two outside of that area into, you know, someplace that might be overlooked or, or competition might not be, you know, quite so fierce. But you're also buying for the longer term too, which uh, is is different than a lot of folks' uh, approach, especially when you're syndicating, because a lot of times investors are expecting that uh, you know that big payoff in three to five to seven years, whatever it may be, right. uh, that you're going to sell and uh, you know and and take a, you, you're not really flipping. I mean, you have sold some properties, but it seems like your your, your strategy is more sort of buying for the long term. Yeah, we we definitely have you know. I've, Every time I buy a property, I, well, I should say that the vast majority of times we buy a property, it's, it's, it's with the idea that we're going to hold it indefinitely. And that is one of the reasons we haven't done syndication. You know, I, I think that when you bring an investor in, they, they've got expectations. They, they want to get their cash flow. They want their checks in the mail. And, and, they, and at a certain point, they want their money back um, on an exit. So not syndicating you know, if, if we want to really invest in a property and make it better, I love the ability to be able to just say, we're not going to touch the cash flow from this property ever. We're going to keep putting the money that the property generates back into the property. At some point, we might refinance it, take some cash out, buy some more properties. Um, but when, you, when you're willing to make that sacrifice and keep putting the money back in, um, you can do some pretty extraordinary things and, and you can really can't do that when you're, when you're syndicating and, and, um, you know, I, I don't like to sell, you know, I think, um, just recently we've kind of looked across our portfolio and, and, you know, we haven't sold a lot in the past, but we're starting to say, Hey, we've got, we've got, you know, quite a few smaller properties that just from an efficiency standpoint, we're, we're going to sell some of those off and just immediately put that cash into some larger assets. But um, our philosophy that's worked really well for us is buy and hold. That's the, sort of the cons of syndicating. You know, the, the, pro, the pros are you, you, can, you can grow a lot faster. You can buy larger properties. Um, you, can, you can raise the money up front to do the, do the renovations and improve a property. Um, and, and, you know, you can get a lot more people involved and, in, in, um, you know, a lot more people can be successful with that. So. Um, you know, it, it's just two different, two different paths to get to the, you know, the same goal. Right. Well, what uh, would you say is, uh, maybe just to give us an example, cause you've talked, you know, sort of in general terms here, maybe you can give us an example of, uh, sort of your best creative finance deal, uh, that you've had that, uh, you know, maybe you employed a number of different, uh, different avenues to, uh, uh to finance that. It's only been a couple times, um. I can think of two that we've actually not put any cash into a deal. Um, the larger one was actually a 115 unit um, multifamily property. And it, it, it oddly enough, there, there, there's, there's a, I, I won't go into the entire backstory, but you know, long story short, it was a, it was a affordable housing community that was scheduled to the, the uh, HUD HAP contract, they call it, was scheduled to expire. And we bought it, we, you know, we put it under contract with the intention of making it market rate housing. Um, what happened is that someone, someone within the, the, the company of the seller, when, when, the, when the renewal came in from HUD, right before closing, they actually signed it accidentally, not realizing, um, you know, what kind of one person wasn't talking to another. And we went forward with the contract and bought the property. And I, and I give that as a backstory because it isn't one we ended up selling. And it's because <laughs> we moved forward with it because it was such a great deal, but we didn't want to manage, you know, we didn't have a, the expertise to manage uh, um, affordable housing. So, but in any case, that that's the backstory. In terms of the, how it was financed, what, what made it really unique is that, um, you know, we, we, we exercised a lot of the, the things that I shared with you earlier on, it was, we actually got the property at, at a really great price. It was, it was a $2.4 million property. 
um, but it was in really rough shape. You know, the seller had let it run down um, in, uh, you know, so we, we negotiated a good price you know, in, in the seller. Part, part of it was it was not it was not cash flowing. And that's part of why we got the great price. But as we dug into it, we, we started to realize that what the seller didn't know is that their staff on site were basically robbing them blind. Um, there was all sorts of theft going on. Um, and, you know, we found that out by talking to local contractors and really doing some extensive due diligence as we evaluated the property. And, uh, you know, we ended up knowing a lot more about the property we were buying than the seller knew about the property they were selling. And uh, when you've got a property that's not making money, it's hard to command a, a good price. So we got a great price rate to begin with. And we knew if we if we clean things up, it would cash flow. So 2.4 million. Um, and what we also negotiated was that the seller would finance five hundred thousand dollars for us. In a, in a second position, a note that they would carry back. And they agreed to do that. Um, we got a 30-year amortization period, 3% um, interest. And um, we also went to a bank and, and, and borrowed 75%. So you know, if, you, if you start to run the numbers there, you realize that $500,000 second position, 75,000 from the bank, we, that's more than, you know, it's, that's, that's, uh, we're going to come out ahead on this deal. Um, so the, uh, the appraisal the, you know, the bank, did the bank actually had said when they, when they saw the package, the bank came back and they said, well, it's going to have to appraise higher than 2.4 million for us to, to agree to this. And, and the appraisal did come through. Um, so, um, you know, we, and we also had, had negotiated some smaller credits in, into the deal and, um, we closed at the beginning of the month, just, just like we, we, we love to do. And since it was a HUD property that, you know, that all the, all the, uh, the vast majority of the, the rent had been wired in on the first of the month. And we closed a, just a couple of days later and we, uh, we ended up walking out of closing with a, with a, with a pretty good sized check. Really? So uh -huh. Those kind of those kind of things don't come along very often, and you know I almost hate to share the story because people people uh, you know they're like oh there's no way to find something like that well you know I, for the last 12 years you know I, I I can't even imagine how many thousands of properties I've you know researched and gone after to this point and you know unless you're willing to put that in you know these don't they just don't fall out of the sky and land in your lap you know, this, this was a, this was a property and an owner that I've been calling year after year for, for years, you know, trying to convince them to sell and building that relationship. Oh, so you went right to seller then. Yeah. Um, yep. Wow. I wanted the property like years before this happened, I, I reached out to him and I kept telling him, if you're ever ready to sell, you give me a call. And, and it worked, you know, they, they finally did. Um, so it, it, it worked out for us. We, because we don't do affordable housing generally, um, I found somebody that I trusted who was managing another local affordable housing complex. And we worked out an arrangement where they would uh, manage it for us. And uh, about a year and a half later, we, we sold it and, and made, we cleared about a million dollars profit. Gee whiz, unbelievable, man. Did you have to put a lot into it though? To You said it was in pretty bad shape. I mean, did you have to? We, we, we did put some into it, but, um, the, the, uh, the company that ended up buying it was actually the company that was managing it for us. And, mm. uh, they put together a package that, um, they, they were going to get a, a, a whole bunch of, you know, development incentives and, and, uh, affordable housing incentives from the government to do a full rehab, you know, um, for, for the whole thing. And so, you know, we didn't we didn't end up putting that much in because we just needed to get it through until until the sale. Wow, wow, guy, that's an amazing, absolutely amazing deal. You uh, you know, consciously search for like off market deals like this, like where you're going direct to seller, um, or are you? Uh, what's I mean, how are you finding the deals that you're finding? So in in the in our marketplace where we have focused up until this year. I, I, of course, I look at things that come onto the market and I always, I always check everything that comes onto the market, 
but you know, I, over the years became familiar with pretty much every property that I might have an interest in. So I really got to understand the market. Every time I found a property that I said, wow, I love the location. I love how this looks. I would be, if this were to be for sale, I would, I would be interested. If I see any property like that, I track down the owner and I let them know I want to buy it. Um, and that's, that's just how I do it. Like I, I don't, I, in, in my mind, everything, you know, every property that's out there is for sale. I don't really make the distinction about what's listed and what's not listed. So every property, you know, our, our, we, the city we operate in, the, the population of the, the metropolitan statistical area, I think it's a little over 50,000. So it's, it's fairly small. And in the county that we operate, I probably know every single property that we would have an interest in. And by now I've, I've reached out to an owner and said, introduce myself, you know, tell them some positive things about their property, tell them I see where, you know, there's opportunity. Um, and that if they ever have an interest in selling, you know, I, I hope they would, they would let me know. And, um, people are generally receptive to that. What, what they're not receptive to is if you call them up and say, you know, I, I saw your property, it's a dump. You're not taking care of it. it look, I can see you don't want it anymore. You know, that, that's a good way to, <laughs> yeah, really that's a good way to sell it. <laughs> um, but even if it's, even if it's in really rough shape, you know, you, the way to say that is I can see there's opportunity there. You know, I see the potential and they'll appreciate that because, you know, they, they, they're going to recognize if it's not taken care of. And, and in their mind, they probably do know that there's potential if someone were to do it. And, and uh, you know, I, you want to, a lot of people can take it personally if their property is insulted. They, a lot of them, you know, if if it's their only property, they might even have some of their self identity wrapped up in that property. There might be some emotional ties. So I want them to know I see the potential. I want them to know what I would do if I bought it, which is take great care of it, fix it up, and uh, you know, really make it something that they could be proud of um, after the sale. And and you know, I communicate that in a way that's positive and um, try to just establish that relationship and at least leave the conversation with them um hopefully being open to taking my call you know six months to a year down the road when i just kind of check in with them and see how things are going well that's great and what is your criteria for uh multifamily deals what what are you looking for ideally right now we generally are looking for things uh 70 units and up um you know, I, I'm I'm looking for um, a significant amount of value add, especially today when when the asking prices are are um, you know pretty high, and uh, you know I've I've got to find some way right out of the gate that I'm comfortable that I can create some equity, and you know get get that cash flow so that if prices drop, if cap if cap rates go up, that um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm trying also to lock in rates longer term. I think the ideal situation is you get some agency debt on a property that cash flows. You have a way to boost that cash flow after closing. And, um, you know, you can lock in, you can lock in an interest rate for 10 years so that you can ride out any, any, uh, you know, any problems that might happen between now and then. And, um, so we're a lot of times that ends up being, say 70s 80s 90s construction you know I, what i've realized is if it's something that's further away i i don't want to go with something that's quite as distressed as some of the things i've taken on that are local um so i would have a higher reliance on third parties and, and and not be able to give it as much attention as i have if it's right you know right around the block from me and uh so you know probably look at more 80s to 90s you know value add through below market rents or you know some pretty um straightforward renovations that can you know boost rents through you know higher end finishes or uh wash dryer hookups or some something along those lines are, are do you care about uh you know garden style uh, pitch roofs things like that Definitely have a preference for pitch roofs, but um, I'm probably not quite as afraid of flat roofs as, as many multifamily buyers. And that's just because I started off with more commercial properties and, you know, they, a lot of my office buildings and, and retail buildings have flat roofs. Um, so I, I, I know what it entails and maybe a little, little less fear of that, but in terms of just 
the overall appeal architecturally of a building, I, I, the, the flat roofs are harder to find. I think that that present well. Um, but if it was visually appealing and, and, and it had a lot of other things going for it, I, I wouldn't be deterred by a flat roof. Gotcha. And you're, you're still for the most part though, looking in, in New York, right? I mean, you're not necessarily looking in the South or Midwest or, I mean, you, you still want to be able to drive there for the most part at this point. Well, I'm looking at, I, I'm doing both right now, actually, oh, okay. as I'm, as I'm sort of, uh, meeting other investors and, and, um, other potential partners, I've begun to evaluate more recently properties in the Southeast. Um, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm definitely looking further afield. I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, I've got, um, kids that are heading off to college and I'm getting sort of to a point where I, I feel like it could be possible for me to split my time and spend part of the year, um, in a different market where I can get another foothold and, and, um, you know, be closer to keep an eye on things, which I, which I think is important and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe grow our company out of, uh, somewhere down South. Uh, that's neat. That's neat. Wow. Well, Brian, I could be I could talk to you for the next couple hours here with no problem here. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> I really appreciate your being on. How can folks uh, find out more about you and your company or maybe even reach out to you if uh, you, you, you want to make that available? But uh, um, what, what's sort of the best way to, to find out uh, find out what you're doing? Yeah, well, you can uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. Um, our, uh, our company website is WashingtonStreetProperties.com. Uh, my, my book website is crushing it.info, or you can, you can find crushing it in apartments and commercial real estate on amazon.com. And certainly if any of your listeners read the book and, and still have questions after, after they finish that, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear from them. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, we will definitely have a link on, on, in our show notes uh, for that. And, uh, it will be our featured book for the week, uh, in our newsletter. So, uh, definitely, uh, Wow, great. Well, uh, Brian, uh, thank you again for being on. Um, of course, you know, we're not over yet. We, we always close out the show with, uh, you know, your most embarrassing moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, go for it. Oh, oh that was good. That was a good <laughs> one. <laughs> and there's a lot of meat in this interview here. It'll be just laid out for you in detail in our show notes at uh, olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. And you're going to look for the episode with Brian Murray. Well, that's the show for today. Remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.